Okay, let's um, let's go. Let's start. Laptops away. Yeah, I heard it sucks. All right, so grab a seat and. All right, here we go. So, to, I've been really, really looking forward to this class. Um, it's kind of been in the planning for maybe a, a couple years, in a way. Um, I've, I've been waiting until the opportunity um, to be able to do this, this particular class. Um, but it's been in the past three weeks that or three or four weeks that we realize, realize, hey, it might be a possibility. And um, the title is, I'm a Bad Person. And later we'll explain the meaning of that title. Um, but this class also goes back to my TED Talk on Iraq. And just like Bassem, who you met, contacted me after watching my TED Talk, Many other people contacted me after watching the talk. And uh, lots of people had different reasons for doing that. And um, one person who contacted me was this gentleman. And he said that somehow he stumbled upon the talk and he listened to it and it really motivated him to reach out to me. And so we started a correspondence, and he sent me a, a, um, an article that he wrote called A Soldier's Story. And students in this class for the past several semesters have been reading this story. And he sent me a link to his book, and I, I bought his book called God Is Not Here. And when a soldier, including particularly someone who's had a lot of experience in deployments and who is elevated to the rank of lieutenant colonel, writes a book called God is Not Here. It makes me really curious to see what it is that they're seeing. And so, as it turns out, um, this gentleman, lieutenant colonel, uh, Bill Edmonds is here visiting us today, and so I'm going to welcome him to Social 119. So, come on up. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for coming. My pleasure. Hey, let, before you start, I know that you're going to say something about... Mm -hmm. well, why did you reach out to me? <laughs> what did you why? see in that talk? Wow. Um, well, I, I, I saw someone reflecting back um, who hadn't experienced war, someone reflect back my views um, mm -hmm. that I developed when I was in Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, you know, seeing um, ourselves um, from someone else's perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the experience that I was able, I, I was afforded in Iraq, um, was be able to, you know, see all of, you know, our strengths and weaknesses, our foibles and faults um, from their eyes, mm. um, which is an eye opener. Yeah, uh, yeah, very cool. I, I, I appreciate it. And thanks for coming because, I mean, you're coming all the way from Germany. Yeah. And, and, and why are you here? <laughs> like, what's, what's your reason for speaking, especially to a, a group of mostly college students? You know, I, I've honestly, um, the reason I'm here, um, you know, be, we become wise not, not only by creating new knowledge. You know, we, we become wise um, by remembering things that, re, you know, nearly every major religion, spiritual tradition, uh, humanistic tradition has, been, has learned and then which we've forgotten. 
um, over and over again in our lives. And, you know, several years ago, um, life smacked me over the head. I lived my life, and now I'm 49. I learned that I was living unwisely. Um, you know, and that, it, if nothing else, that required um, for me to find death before death could find me. Um, and what happened, you know, it required a lot of motivation uh, on my part. So I was a particularly dense guy. Uh, and so, you know, it required multiple, like, multiple combat deployments, uh, life and death um, experiences, as well as many years of suffering. Um, you know, but what I would like, nothing better in the world than that you are able to find yourself, know who, tr- who you truly are, uh, without all of the kicking and screaming that, that I went through. Uh, hopefully you can learn from my mistakes. M- maybe I'll learn something also. Hey, let, so let's talk about you. So you are, so I, we, we have some photos, so I put a slideshow together. Um, tell us, just, we're going to go through this part quite briefly. So who's, who are these folks up here? Well, I'm, you know, I, I, as this class is, I'm, I'm one of, uh, you know, countless American um, archetypes. You know, I'm the, um, you know, I'm, I'm a descendant of German Swedes and Native Americans who went west uh, to become Oregon um, homesteaders. Um, I'm a brother, older brother of a, a Oregon medicinal marijuana grower. I'm the brother of two Venezuelan sisters and two Mexican sisters who later became my adopted sisters. Uh, uh, and and yeah, and and um, the son of two beautiful people. Um, you know, after they graduated from UC Berkeley, they decided to go into the Peace Corps and not Vietnam War. And as I grew into adulthood, you know, I, I was able to watch them dedicate their lives to serving disadvantaged children in inner city Los Angeles and then in a small rural agricultural town. Um, and so, you know, I, I, they were willing to um, leave the comforts of, of family and home to help out those uh, who were more fortunate. However, I, I decided to do the same thing, however, with a rifle. So you are one of those people that I often refer to as social workers with guns. Yeah. That that's the way you chose. Because, you know, I talk about soldiers. My experience in working with militaries mm-hmm. um, is that most people who, go, who volunteer to be part of militaries do so out of uh, desire to make the world a better place. Not to kill people, but actually to keep people from killing other people. So. Um, and this is your yes. nuclear family. That's, that's you know, I family. put both of these slides up here, by the way, because of his, his younger daughter. <laughs> <laughs> the faces. He had about five slides that he showed me, and every one, they were funny. Yeah. That's, that's, my, that's my family. I, um, when, I, when I got back from Iraq, I met my wife and focused my energies, um, locking away my memories uh, from Iraq and focusing myself on creating a new life. Um, my wife, Cheryl, who's an acupuncturist, um, and my two daughters, Ava and Natalie, who are now fluent German speakers going to uh, German school. Yeah. Because you're living in Germany yes. at this point. And still in the military, by the way. And then, so this is you and your first deployment, right? You were young here? How old were you? Uh, 19. In that Desert was, Storm. That was back. Desert Storm. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, is this you right here? Yes, that's, that's me. Yeah. Um, if... If you were to ask my family where our discussion should begin, it was probably you know, an unexpected life decision. When I was 17, as a junior in high school, I decided to join the military. Uh, and I went into the Army Rangers um, and then a, a Desert Storm uh, in 90, 1991. And I returned and went to college and got my uh, first BA uh, mm-hmm. and then um, in a commission as an Army uh, second lieutenant in the infantry. All right. And here, this is you in Iraq. Yeah, yeah, that's you in the middle, the handsome guy, right? Yeah, I wouldn't go that so that far. I see, could be that guy. All right, and this is you also in Iraq. Yes. Who is this young man? Uh, that's the the son of um, our interpreter. Uh, we had about five uh, Iraqi interpreters, uh, ranging from um, Iraqi Arabs to uh, um, Iraqi Kurds to uh, Syrian Kurds. Uh huh. And. Yeah, that's, that's a cool. It's a really cool photo. Yeah. And unfortunately, he, he couldn't he couldn't go to school. It's too dangerous. So his father would bring him to the base, and he did odd jobs around the base. Uh huh. Yeah. And this is you with Iraqi soldiers. Yes. In um, the mess it, 
We, I lived on a, a little, tiny, little tiny Iraqi base in the center of Mosul um, called the Guest House. It was formerly the, one of the retreats of um, Usay, uh, Hussein, mm -hmm. one of Saddam Hussein's sons. Um, I, I lived with about um, six other Americans um, and about 400 Iraqis. And I should say, so we're talking here about one deployment for you. You've yeah. been deployed many times. Yeah. Like how many times? Um, 14. 14? Yeah. Okay. Um, and this is you out jogging? Yeah, that's, the, that's, the, that's the base. So we, it was a tiny little base, maybe you know, 500 meters long. Um, that, that was about the first three months. I, after about the first three months there, I, I, I you know, was shot at multiple times and just missed. So I decided it wasn't appropriate to... Wait, people used to shoot you while you were running? Yeah. Do you, 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 you over the fence. So, over your head? Yeah. Did you see the bullets Oh, I saw there? the bullets. Hit, you know? yeah. So after that, I ran literally a... a, a a three-minute loop uh, that was in the trees a little closer. You'll see the trees in yeah. the uh, next slide. Yeah. So. All right. No, we won't. We took that one out. Okay, so, <laughs> let's, um, so let's, talk, let's talk breakdown. Um, and by the way, just so you know where we're going here, this is... Uh, I, I, I'm, let me just speak for a second, okay? Um, I've heard that's not very hard. We're, so we're headed, this is a really, in, in many ways, uh, uh, you'll, you'll see as we move forward, a, a very difficult class. Um, and I, I'm, just, I'm just bringing the energy into the room. We're going to go somewhere in this class that, um, that we don't often go, okay? So we're going to talk breakdown, and we're going to talk about breakdown in Iraq before internal breakdown. Um, so one thing that jumped out for me when I started reading that article, and I was telling uh, Bill today that when, I, when he sent me his article and I started reading it, I read the first line, and then I pulled myself away from my desk, and I just kind of gathered myself. I looked down. I just had to really pull myself together because I said, this is going to really take me somewhere. Um, and then I brought, brought myself back to the computer and continued reading. And here is the first line. Um, for just a minute or two, step into my life. I'm an American soldier in the Army Special Forces. I have just returned from a one-year tour of duty in Iraq, where I lived, shared meals, slept and fought beside my Iraqi counterpart as we battled insurgents in the center of a thousand-year-old city. I am a conflicted man. And I, want, man. and I want you to read the story of that experience as I lived it. And um, we'll send, I'll send the article out to class, but I have to say it was one of the most powerful things that I've ever read about war. And um, so let's talk about that experience. Who, um, this is you, and who are these guys? What are you doing? What are you, what's happening uh, that, here? That's one of the um, many nightly raids that we, my, my, jo my job was to um, partner with an Iraqi intelligence officer, just one person, who had been interrogating insurg insurgents for about 30 years, traitors, criminals, um, and terrorists. Um, and it was my job to help him um, find information so that we could go out and capture insurgents. Um, so this is, this is one of the many um, patrols, or not, not patrols, but raids at nighttime that the Iraqis went on that I assisted with. And, and, and you are in Mosul here. Yes. Very close to Bassam's house, actually. Yeah, just about, um, I, 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 I think it's about a half a mile. Yeah, yeah, I, as best as I was able to ascertain. So you, so what's so interesting is you, here, Bassam was standing right where you're standing, mm -hmm. and here you are several weeks later, and the two of you were living about a kilometer apart. So, um, and so here you've gone out, and when you talk about Iraqi insurgents, you're talking about insurgents who are killing Mostly other Iraqis, but also attacking Americans. Yeah, um, yes. Um, so both. Both. 
yep. um, Iraqis and uh, Americans. Uh, unfortunately, it was mo mostly Iraqis that uh, got killed. Uh, and, and, and so, the, and these are some people that you picked up. Um, well, not me. Yeah, I mean the, the Iraqis, Iraqis picked them up. You know, um, you know, my job was to help him interrogate, uh, get information, go out find, so that we can interrogate more. And it was a um, never-ending cycle. Uh, um, and when we would, would bring, uh, they would bring people in. They would have um, at the time, 2005. This was a very well, it is still, but it was a very dangerous time, uh, especially for Iraqis who were in the Iraqi military uh, and were uh, working with um, Americans. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, and, and it was often, often that those that we captured were released for a variety of reasons. Uh, so the Iraqis were very worried about their faces being seen. So. The, the sandbags um, were primarily for the safety of the Iraqis uh, that were either in the missions or uh, yep. interrogated. So this isn't this bag on that person's head is to keep them from being able to identify, identify yeah. the other Iraqi soldiers who yeah. have brought them in, so that they don't then carry out acts of violence against yeah. them. So when we talk about Iraq breaking the breakdown in Iraq. Um, I think, I, you know, as we talk about this, you, you and I were talking earlier, I think it's really important for people to understand that Iraqi, after we invaded and, um, and Saddam Hussein, kicked out Saddam Hussein, um, naturally any society, it's not just Iraq, it would happen here in the United States. And Matt, so here, let's just do like a mind thing really fast. Imagine what would happen here if suddenly you woke up in the morning and another, another country had invaded the United States and got rid of our entire central government. The presidency and Congress, everything was in an up, uh, and was up in the air. We didn't know who was in charge. Is the legislative branch in charge? Who's making decisions? What about the police, FBI, anything? I mean, it's all just up in the air. And so the whole government just sort of falls apart. And so what happened at this point in time is that, and, t and tell me if I get it right and you add to it, one, one thing that we did was we um, uh, broke down, Gosh, the, the verb is, uh, we dismantled the Iraqi military. So all these people who are in the military and all these guns suddenly have nowhere to go. They have no jobs and the guns are on the streets and everybody has the streets. And we, the Americans, make a decision to dismantle the military. Mm -hmm. And now there's total chaos. I mean, but also you have to understand that you know, this is not a value judgment. This is just um, what happened. When, when we made the decision to um, disband all of the Iraqi security forces, um, most of the leaders in that time were Ba'athists. Uh, they were of a, you know, of a party that was beholden to Saddam Hussein. Uh, and they depended on their positions for their welfare and life. And then all of a sudden, within a second, it was all gone. Um, and so that became one of the many backbones of an insurgency uh, that would arise you know, about a year and a half after our initial uh, invasion in Iraq. So there's nothing unique about Iraqis being particularly violent, particularly crazy, particularly this. It's, no. this is going to be the same in any society. But you were there at this particular time when things really fell apart. This insurgency, insurgency emerged. Mm -hmm. Who People who were really angry yes. at the Iraqis, angry at the Americans, angry at... I mean, there, there, there wasn't a, a single stereotype. Um, there, I mean, just like any city in America and the violence there, uh, um, you're going to have a, a thousand different motivations for wanting to, to fight. Um, mm -hmm. you, know, from, you know, all the way from those who just use the chaos, the anarchy, uh, because uh, for personal reasons, power and greed, mm -hmm. uh, to those who are very moral uh, and just learned over time to hate Americans, uh, all the way to very um, um, those who subverted Islam. Mm -hmm. So... Um, so this is where this is where you were. This is right in here, right? Is the yeah that the that's prison? that's the guest house. Um, just to the left is where I ran in the trees. Um, but right behind, right to the left of that pickup truck in, in the basement is where the, the prison was. Um, um, it's mostly dark, um, mildew on the walls, uh, cold. Uh, it held about uh, six six people, but often there was a lot more than uh, just six. And then, and then, and you were one year working out of that yeah. basement prison. Yeah, one 
One, literally, I mean, the, the, the base was, you know, probably um, 300 meters by 200 meters. It was just a very small, tiny little base right in the center and surrounded, you know, by uh, destroyed buildings on one side and, and the Tigris River on the other side. Um, and so my life um, consisted of a, of a triangle between the prison where I slept was about, you know, literally where I, this picture is taken on, is on the roof of where I slept. Uh, and then the, the place where we ate food uh, with the Iraqis, which was about... 100 feet uh, to the left there. So uh, that was life. Um, that mm -hmm. and uh, patrols. And, and this gentleman? Yeah, that's uh, Sadie, which is Arabic uh, for sir. Um, that's Sadie. He's, he was my, my, my uh, partner um, in life for one year. And he's, the, he's this Iraqi? He's the Iraqi colonel. Uh, that My job was to advise and assist in his interrogations with his prisoners. However, my, you know, that, that was my... Um, job responsibility. My moral responsibility was to try to uh, deter him from resorting to torture uh, and to abide by the Geneva Conventions. So what happens is, you, so the Iraqi military, they go out on patrol, they hear about people who are part of the insurgency, mm -hmm. and they get tips, you know, either from other insurgents that they brought in or somebody out in the street, they hear about it, they go out at night, they bring people in who are who they need to question because they need to stop it. People are, get, people are getting killed. I mean, innocent people are being killed all over the city. Mm -hmm. And so the goal is to stop the killing. And they go out at night searching for people, bringing people in, and now you gotta interrogate them because you don't know if they're innocent or guilty or what they know or who the ringleader is or, yeah. am, I, did I, am I getting it? Yeah, pretty much um, that, was, uh, that was a job. Um, you know, and, and what's happening here? Uh, that, that's um, when they first bring uh, prisoners off the streets. Um, they would, it's kind of like triage, uh, where you, you first sit down, and then this is a guard. Uh, on the left is a guard talking to the prisoner uh, just to get some of the basic information. Uh, your name, uh, where you live, um, how old are you, that kind of things. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And who's... Who, who's this guy here. Well, um, in, at the time in Iraq, and especially in Mosul, um, there was a lot of fissures uh, that were opened up in society uh, because of the invasion. Uh, um, and there, like any city, um, people use that chaos for their own benefit. But the, the, the rationale for becoming an insurgent um, was extremely varied, um, but rarely rarely, and I think this is probably the only one or two people um, that did it because they believed, but their the religion required them to do it. Most everyone there was an insurgent for a variety of reasons, primarily not religious reasons. Uh, they used religion as a tool uh, to, to take advantage of the base angers in society, whether that, whether that be, you know, um, people that became angry um, because of our strategies, our policies, our, our, our tactics on the ground, our one-on-one -on -one personal interactions with Ira Iraqi, um, we're creating more insurgents than we could ever capture or kill. Uh, or because of us killing civilians. Well, that's what I'm saying. Right. Yeah, 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 got you. Yeah. Because of the, so that the tactics of the, of say the, the Americans or, um, you know, Mostly Americans. Yeah. That's, that's, I guess, what happens when um, you live in a, in a, a self-contained, isolated bubble of, of American society, uh, and then everyone on the other side of the fence is conceptually believed as the enemy. Yeah. Uh, and so you go out there thinking um, that you're going into um, dangerous, where everyone is a, is a hostile. Uh, mm -hmm. And then if that is what you believe, that is what you create. What you create, yeah. yeah. So this is one. So you're there, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, yeah. of, um, you know, breaking down, pr talking to prisoners, talking, and the, you, one or two people who actually wove Islam their their yeah. faith into there. So, yeah. so who's this guy? Um, every once in a while, my my counterpart, the Iraqi colonel, would come across someone who he thought um, was an insurgent for the morally right reasons that he. He truly believed that he was doing the right thing for the right reasons, that he was a moral person that just hated Americans. 
Um, and every once in a while, we would get someone like that. And he asked, would ask me to sit down and interact with that person on a one-on-one -on -one basis uh, so that we could you know, put that, you know, it, it's very hard to hate someone when you not only see them, but you talk with them and interact with them. Um, and so that's, that's an example of, of um, in time, um, we became friends. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so he, so you're really, and he spoke English well. Yeah, he was a, uh, he was a uh, educated University of Mosul. Um, so this even, is a guy who was in 2003. He, he was working on the American bases uh, to install IT um, IT equipment. For but but he for but from what he saw. Yeah, and for what he saw, over time he just became angry, mm -hmm. and he wanted to fight back. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. mm -hmm. I think you know one of the things that I often say. I mean, people because people. If you're not if you're not studying, right? So you know we so we're connected in this way. I mean, for me, all militaries, the U.S. military does really amazingly, really awesome things. I mean, we do some great things and we do some not great things, and there's always unintended consequence of actions. Mm -hmm. And one is that civilians die and people get hurt. And when you see that happening, think about Bassam. Bassam easily could have turned to hate and Bassam worked through it and he didn't turn toward hate but would any but we all know we all know his story and we can un, and if he had turned toward hate how many of us would say oh you shouldn't do that you shouldn't be hateful come on most of us would be that's the question that Americans have for Bassam how do you not hate and so you could ask the same thing for this gentleman here how do you not hate different reasons but still so um so what's so now we're gonna we're gonna walk into some of the complexity of 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 your work. It's not just interviewing people. It's not just understanding them. It's not. It is immensely complex, and the breakdown of Iraqi society then because because of what's happening in your role starts begins a process of breakdown inside of you. Yeah. So what, what is happening here? Who are these two people? Um, over time, you know, all, all of the interrogations, um, you know, became, reality became condensed. It became like a thick soup uh, that just poured uh, down my mouth. And, and over time, every, every name became a face, and every face, whether that face be an angel or devil, uh, seemed to condemn me to moral failure because almost every decision resulted in, in the opposite of every best intention. Uh, and that's what happens when you are literally, you know, live and work in the crucible of, of, of human existence. Um, and it didn't matter the choice you made. Um, you know, we got information about a young girl um, that was kidnapped and uh, to make us a, a, a sex slave. Uh, but we got the information too late. And so we went out to um, find her. and. and Unfortunately, she wasn't there, so we found, we captured uh, a father, his brother, uh, and, and that father's son. And we pitted this family uh, together. And, uh, you know, the, the father would yell at the son, you know, um, no, it's not me, it's you're the one who killed her. You're the one who uh, shot her with two rounds to the back of the head. And the son would scream back at the, the, the uncle, no, you know, I, you're the one who had sex with her. And the uncle would scream back to the son, no, you're the one who threw her in the river. Um, we found her body a few days later uh, in, in the reeds of the Tigris River. Uh, her name was Aisha, and she was 12 years old. Um, yeah. and, and this is important because you, what? Well, in this, we, in, in this, in this case, it was, um, I, my, my job was, I said, tr I felt responsible at this time um, because uh, we got the information too late. Um, and the Iraqis wanted to use harsher techniques uh, on on the prisoners. Um, and um, you know, I, I would my one of because I couldn't give orders. My my job was to use persuasion, uh, uh, and often that persuasion would sometimes work, and sometimes it, it wouldn't work. And and you chose the persuasion tactic. Yes. Time passes by. Time passes by, and, and the, yeah, the, um, no matter what happens, 
You know, uh, war, war is a moral minefield. Uh, every, every single step, every single choice you make um, feels like, can feel like you're dying a little death because it's not um, where a moral decision doesn't necessarily result in here uh, a, a, a catastrophic mm -hmm. um, event. There you can see the consequences, you can smell the consequences, you can touch, taste, and even feel the consequences of, of your decisions uh, uh, that happen uh, in the future. So every decision that you're making, if you slow down because you're trying to follow the, the do you follow your own conscious and conscience, and then the, the result of you following your conscience, which is what most everybody, say Americans would say, the average Americans would follow your conscience, and then the result of that is a bad outcome. And then if you follow your the, your bad instincts, then the result is a bad outcome. You know, it's so go go to. Um, well, what, I mean, one of the one of the the prisoners I convinced the Iraqis not to uh, to release um, went out, and this is Master Sergeant Anthony York, uh, um, Yost. A Anthony was killed in a, buoy, a house that was booby-trapped by a prisoner uh, that I convinced the Iraqis uh, to not torture and to, to release. To release. Uh, Tony is survived by his wife uh, and three children. Yeah. So, you, um, so you said that quickly, and I, I, wanna, I, I don't want to keep you in the space, but I want, because it's, it's important that people understand when we send soldiers off to war, when we send people off to war, it's not just sending them off to war, we're sending them off to be transformed and sometimes transformed in really very painful and difficult ways. So what you just said, what you said was, so you convinced, they brought some insurgent in, they brought somebody in, you convinced the I Iraqis, convinced the Iraqis to, 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 to let them go. To let them go. Uh, and, and, and not to torture him because that, that, that insurgent was refused to talk. Um, and Anthony went into a house that was um, unfortunately in booby, booby trapped by that insurgent and the house um, collapsed down on top of him. And so part of war, which is what we're going to now, we're moving into is this conversation of part of the casualties of war mm -hmm. are all of the conflicted feelings and realities the soldiers bring home with them that result from the from them trying to make the best possible decision that they can make that leads to terrible outcomes. And so this is, he is one terrible outcome. Um, and this gentleman. Um, I, I don't remember uh, his name. Um, what I do remember was that he, he was one of the, the insurgents that we captured and I again convinced the Iraqis to, to release him. Um, three months later he was captured again and brought back to the prison uh, where I lived and worked um, and with him we found out that he had gone on uh, after I released him to, to kill, uh, ex execute 10 Iraqi civilians. Um, you know, he described it, you know, either shooting them in the bullet with the back of the head or, or sawing their head off uh, with a knife. And I watched the videotapes of, of him doing that. Um, we, you watched the video? So he's well, yes, in? Yeah, uh, yes. And, and I asked him, you know, what, who were these people uh, that you executed? And he said, essentially, you know, I, I don't know their names. I, you know, I was, I was paid $50 for each victim. And... Did you watch the tapes because you just forced yourself, you felt obligated to well, watch them? I mean, it, well, yeah, it's, it's, it's an obligation. One, one, it's our job to try to figure out, um, mm -hmm. I mean, it's information. Uh, mm -hmm. And we, we had to figure out who he was, where, who these people were. Uh, it could give us um, information about um, other insurgents, other, other terrorists. Yeah. So you... So, and, I'm, I'm just holding this space for a second. So you, you're, you're carrying, that's part of what now you're carrying with you. So the weight of that, these are, so we send you off to war. You know, you enlist voluntarily to say, hey, I'm going to serve my country. I'm going to do the best. My parents are essentially social workers. They join the Peace Corps. They're doing all these amazing things. They're 
very religious, very lovely people. You're saying, I'm going to be a social worker, but I'm going to do it with a gun because I want to protect other people. You get put into this job. You're making the best possible decision that you can trying to figure out to follow the Geneva Conventions on the conduct of war. And, and, and now you're sitting with the weight of, of so much suffering, right? Just to, it's not something that we think about when we think about war. Um, no, but then I, then I learned over time, I, I, I learned that most of the, the prisoners were, were actually innocent. Um, that most of them had been just caught up in the net that the Iraqis used to catch sharks um, and, and also to get information. You know, I, I asked um, my, my partner, you know, you know if, if he could explain this. And he, and he essentially said that, you know, if the information, if the person is guilty, all right, or if the information comes from a guilty person, then the suffering is both necessary and, for, and fortunate. If the information comes from an innocent person, the information is, is, uh, uh, is the suffering is unfortunate, um, but necessary. Um, this, this man, he confessed to things that he didn't do. Um, and I remember the Iraqi interrogator asking him, why, why did you confess? And, and he said, uh, essentially, you know, sir, your, your slaps were so hard that I thought if this was your slap, you know, what, what, what happens when you, when you use a cable? Um, yeah. And, and your job this whole time is to try to, knowing that these interrogations have to happen, they have to occur, otherwise you're not going to get any information. And you've got to try to make it happen in a way that's humane, legal, and yet you, they get the information that they need to get. And you're not doing the interrogation. No, so um, no I, was, I was purely advisor. Yeah. Um, I, I would often sit in the back uh, with a mask over my own head. Um, so, you're, this is, so you're just in this impossible. So, so this photo up here, right? So I, I wanted to use this photo because... This is, this is one that, when you were in Iraq, a buddy, a buddy of yours took this? Uh, this yes. Yeah. So when we're talking, you, you understand, when we're talking about civilians being harmed, um, we, because we were only showing men, but we're talking about people, look at this beautiful girl, right? These are, this, is, this is the harm. So your job is to help ensure, to stop the harm that's coming to average Iraqis. Not and you know you know what I mean and and I and I hold her because she would be a person who could come to harm. So if I'm in your shoes, if I'm doing what you're doing, I'm holding her face in my mind's eye. Also, I'm trying to protect her. I'm trying to protect lots of people, but I'm also trying to protect her. The um, yes, uh, you're, you're you're correct. I mean, it, it, it's it's hard to say. Um, you know, there, there was lots of good that, that happened, you know, but, but what has the most impact are, are the bad things uh, that happened. And one of the, the most bad things, um, at least from many soldiers' perspective, uh, is the, the death of, of women and children. Um, mm -hmm. And when you go to war, you, you, you believe yourself to be capable of stopping that. Uh, and in war, you realize that that isn't possible. Um, war will always throw you a curveball, and people will die, and you will hold yourself responsible. Um, so that line that you just said right there, and you will hold yourself responsible, actually takes us right here. So this is something that you have been writing about. Um, your most recent article from just several months ago uh, was particularly powerful, a moral injury. Um, can you... Just say a little bit about what you mean by that. Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's not me. Mor moral injury is uh, a growing um, understanding that war, life, has impacts uh, on, on people. Um, right now, the, 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 there is only one um, current diagnosis for the psychological trauma of war, and that's PTSD. Now, PTSD is a fear-related uh, trauma. Uh, you have to have experienced some overwhelming fear for your life to be considered um, for a diagnosis of PTSD. Um, however, in war, 
all right? Humans, I mean, one of the things that we do, all right, from birth to death is we derive meaning from things, external situations, whether that be a, a, a wife, a husband, a partner, okay, your children, um, a job, uh, a family, your car, um, the way you look, your body, um, your position of power uh, or respect. One of the other sources of meaning that you derive uh, that give you order in life is your morality, the, the codes, values, and ideals uh, that you, you are grown up with and nurtured over the course of your lifetime. Um, and uh, no matter how moral the person you are, all right, um, um, when you ask a moral person to go to war, um, you know, some, the world, other people, or even yourself will violate that moral code. Um, it's, it's inevitable. And, and one of the, the signature wounds of war uh, is being considered is something called moral injury. Um, yes. So. so I think about, yeah, I think in one of your writings, you called it the signature wound. Well, it wasn't, of I mean, that was, a, I was, that was, that was a quote. I, I believe that that quote came from uh, a yeah. Pulitzer Prize winner and author called David Wood, uh-huh. uh, named David Wood. Yeah. So you, um, Yeah, look, I mean, the thing, the thing, Bill, the thing that so strikes me as I've gotten to know you is, and as I, as I understand more about your family and your parents, is like, is the, the essential goodness that is within you, right? And I don't know you that well, but I, I, I've read now much, much of your writing, um, I've had many conversations with you and um, just the essential goodness. And so when you, I imagine myself, I feel like I'm a moral and ethical being. And I imagine myself sitting, you know, in that, in that basement prison, knowing what has to happen here in order to protect life. And not just my life, right? Because I'm kind of on the base protected, but the lives of innocent people. And for whatever effed up reason, things got to be this way, right? So we can blame it on lots of decisions on the Americans, which I, in my TED talk, for me, it's all about oil. If Iraq didn't have oil, we wouldn't have gone in and we wouldn't have made the decisions to destroy a society so things would break down. And, none of, and this wouldn't have happened and you wouldn't have been there and people wouldn't be getting killed and it would be a very different situation. But now here I am, this person who joins the military in this way that I'm going to try to make the world a better place and I'm stuck in these trying to make a decisions between a terrible decision and a more terrible one. And... Whatever one I make, bad things are going to happen. And now this is weighing on me. Mm-hmm. This is sitting. But, you know, I, I, I want to make sure I'm, I'm absolutely clear. Yeah. Uh, when he says, you know, a terrible decision to a terrible... I, everyone's thinking, you know, torture or not torture. And, you know, I, I want, what yeah. I learned over a year um, is that torture doesn't work. All right? Not only uh, is it morally reprehensible... It's, it's not, not effective. Mm-hmm. Um, and that when, when you torture, um, what you're really doing uh, uh, is, is unconsciously or consciously um, pissed off. And, and, you know, other than the aberrant people who, who do it for fun, uh, it's, you, you, um, it's emotional gratification. Uh, and it doesn't work. Yeah, and I'm thinking the, this idea between, hey, I, I think this guy might be innocent, so we should let him go, but he might be guilty and we should hang on. And, and it's like the, 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 nothing you do, you're going to get it right, you're going to get it wrong. It's just, it's, it's, un, it's really unimaginable. Oh, well, I guess I, one, one of the important lessons I, I learned is that, you know, the future doesn't happen uh, in the future, you know, um, the future happens in the, in the moment. And the, the future that you experience reflects back your inner state of being. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so if you make an immoral decision, the chances are you're going to have an immoral consequence. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yo, 
You know? So, you know, the okay. whole end versus mean thing, yeah. that is the justification for every atrocity, every, every dogma in, in society over 5,600 years uh, can almost be attributed back to absolute certainty that the future holds some utopian state, uh, you know, environment, and it's yeah. better than now. And anything now I do is justified to accomplish that future. Even, but the future will never come. The even future. if I go kill all of these people to make that future that's going to be great, it's never going to come because the path I've taken to do that. Um, so who... Uh, so this is your grandfather, you and your grandfather. Yeah, that's, that's my uh, grandfather, um, Maurice Russell. And, and I, we bring him, uh, this was my um, commission as a second lieutenant. Um, my grandfather was um, a amphibious landing craft captain in the Pacific Cam Campaign in World War II. Um, and he came back from... World War II in that campaign, a completely different person. Um, and But he never, not once, do I remember my grandfather talking about his experiences uh, in war. And, and then I, then I remember, I, I, he was dying um, and in, on bed, and I sat down next to him and held his hand, uh, and the doctors had given him morphine. Um, and, and in the delirium morphine, he started to cry uh, and... and and asked for forgiveness for all of the young boys that he thought that he was responsible for killing because he was the person who brought them onto the beach and opened you know, the gates. Have you ever seen Saving Private Ryan? He was the captain of that landing craft. Uh, and you know, thousands of, of young Americans were killed. And he held that inside uh, you know, for his entire life. And it wasn't until his last you know, literally 10 seconds 15 seconds, that that came out, um, and he asked for forgiveness. Imagine, okay, um, how important it would have been for him to have asked for forgiveness 40 years earlier, and how that would have affected not only him, but all the people that he interacted with day in and day out of life. Forgiveness is not something you give someone else. Forgiveness is a state of being, okay? All right. It helps you, and by helping yourself, you help everyone else. It's when you don't attach, um, you let go of the past. All right. Unforgiveness is inability to let go of the past. So, so let's. So, we're, so this is the title of the lecture. Tell us briefly about. Well, this Noah is Pierce. this is uh, Noah Pierce. Noah Pierce is um, uh, former. Um, Army uh, Sergeant, um, and Noah in Iraq, amongst a variety of things, Noah um, ran over an Iraqi child uh, with his Bradley fighting vehicle. Um, it was an accident. Yes, yes, it was an accident. Um, but, you know, he held on to this and probably many other things for you know, for years and years and years. And, and w one of the things that I've learned is that, you know, the, 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 a memory that you can't embrace, all right, is the memory that you can't process. And the memory that you can't process is the memory that you can't transform. And what you can't transform will, will haunt you for life. Um, and that is um, something that happens primarily when you do something that, you know, the world, other people, or yourself do something that violates your strict, you know, code of morality. Whether that, you know, the world suddenly becomes a place, uh, the world is, you know, un no longer meaningful. Other people are no longer benevolent, uh, and, and most destructively, you are no longer a worthy person. Uh, and, you know, the meaning that you once derived from morality, uh, think, I mean, you know, I'm talking in figurative language, and understand the language reflects a brain structure, all right? That gives order in your life. All of a sudden, that order, that, so, that source of meaning that you derive from morality is banished, all right? And in that place, it's a vacuum. And all of a sudden, psychologically, unconsciously, you strive to find some other source of meaning. Unfortunately, most often when you suffer 
some tragic event like this, you grasp on to negative meanings. You, you find responsibility uh, for what has already happened. Um, so, and so you, 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 know, you, you draw a little circle, a conceptual circle around yourself, and you say, you know, the world, all right, I am angry at the world, I'm angry at other people, and then you turn that rage inward. So uh, the, and rage turned inward is shame. And, and that's what happened to you. Well, yeah, and that's what happened, I, I, you know, I believe, to no one. That's what happens to lots of, of, of people, um, yeah. not only in war, but, I mean, war is just, you know, it, it's, just a, it's, it, it's life condensed into a very small space, time uh, and, and environment. So, so we, we, we have, okay, so when you, people might have the sense that you, after this one particular year in Iraq, I mean, this is just one of different deployments, but after this one year, you, you didn't just get here. You yeah. spiraled yeah. and struggled, and it's but for the grace of something that you're actually standing here, that you continued to move forward and, you know, um, you know, when I when I came back from Iraq, you know, there was no, there was no visible wounds, um, but something had changed inside. You know, but like I said before, I you know I locked those memories away and I focused my energy, uh, energies on on creating a new life. You know, a new job, getting married, uh, and and trying to start a family. But you know, over five years, I I I realized that I was still living inside of that basement prison, um, and. Every single second of every single day, those memories would rise like a phoenix uh, uh, and, 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 you know, blossom into a blistering consciousness and then fall down the dust and then, you know, uh, rise once again. Um, um, and, you know, I, I, you know, essentially over time, um, it became exhausting to live. Uh, and, and I, you know, I, I can, the memories are still very vivid, uh, you know, almost immersive uh, virtual reality. You know, I can still uh, picture the smells and sights of, you know, driving in the car uh, and seeing a tight corner approaching and maintaining my speed and with my hands locked on the 10 and 2 and imagining myself uh, going through the, the, the rails um, and imagining, you know, the, the, the feeling of being free um, of yourself. Um, it's not that you want to die. It's that, it's that living has become so painful uh, that it, it seems preferable. And, and um, being free, in your yeah. case also, yeah. what you said, of the shame. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, shame is very different from guilt. You know, yeah. th this is a whole you know, niche. And so guilt is about something you do. It's an action. Uh, it's, uh, guilt allows uh, for redemption and allows for um, absolution. Guilt motivates you to make amends for some action. Shame is about who you are as a person. It makes you want to you know, crawl into the floor and, di and disappear uh, because everyone else can feel how unworthy you are. Um, yeah. and, and by the way, um, th dude, thanks for that. that would, that's a really valuable distinction. Um, because I know that's a feeling that many, many people have. These are the last um, five words in his journal before he took his life, yes. right? Yes. Is that right? Yeah, and, and the last three words were, I am free. I am free. Yeah. And this is part... This is actually his suicide letter. You know, the, the thing that's so powerful, um, the first time that you Skyped into the class, I called the class more than thanks. Because people talk about how much they, it's civilians, how much they appreciate the military and, the, you know, we, the, we sing the national anthem and we recite the Pledge of Allegiance and we thank our troops and we, you know, more, we, you know thank you for serving. And, and it's like, but why, if we appreciate people in the military so much, why among uh, returning veterans is the suicide rate so high, is the self-harm rate so high, is the, because we're, why is that? And so for me, the importance of you speaking and your message is to help people to understand all over the world, war creates trauma and war creates pain. Even when people are trying to do the best possible thing, it doesn't matter. The wounds, most of the wounds from war 
cannot be seen. Mm. And just the wounds from Noah Pierce, who would lead him to write, I am a bad person and I am free before he takes his life. I mean, it's it, the... Um, I want to, just one final piece here that I want to read this quote and then I... So you, you put this in, your, in, in one of your writings. Um, again, kind of coming from what I just said about how sort of easily we talk about war and going to war and we play war games and we have you know, video games and we watch movies and it's just like this thing that we don't often have an opportunity to reflect on what it really is and what it really means. And so Brian... Brian Turner, Turner was in the U.S. Army and he wrote, um, it should make you shake and sweat, nightmare you, strand you in a desert of irrevocable desolation. The consequences seared into the vein. No matter what adrenaline feeds the muscle, it's courage. No matter what God shines down on you. No matter what crackling pain and anger you carry in your fists, my friend, it should break your heart to kill. And how easily we don't take those words into account. And then we put it upon, in the United States anyway, people like you who say, I will volunteer to take that bitter pill and then maybe have to take on this invisible pain that nobody else is going to see, but I'm going to deal with. Um, Can we... I know I want to make sure we have an an opportunity to say something about separation because you have a really important story. Um, And can you say, so you were flying over Africa. Well, you know, I was, um, you know, I I, I talked before about, you know, that downward spiral of, of just not wanting to live in your own skin. Uh, you know, then, then something unexpected happened. And in 2014, I found myself um, in, in Central Africa as part of the, the, one of the U.S. operations uh, to assist Africans in trying to capture uh, and kill Joseph Kony uh, and stop his LRA, uh, Lord's Resistance Army. Um, I'm not sure if you guys remember Joseph Kony or Kony 2012. Um, Kony is a Christian messiah. Um, he believed that he, he, you know, he was the chosen of Jesus uh, and that he talked to God. And he, from 1986 until you know, 2016, his band um, roamed Central Africa and uh, killed almost 100,000 Africans and abducted uh, about 60,000 kids to make them either child soldiers or sex slaves. Um, and I was there. Now, I found myself one day um, coming back from a tiny little um, military out, a South Sudanese military outpost um, that was carved out from the jungles of, of South Sudan. So. Um, and I was in this tiny little uh, airplane. And you know, the, the, the sound... This, this plane? Yes. Yeah, this plane. Now, the, the, yeah. the, the, you know, the, the sound is loud. You know, you can't really hear it, can you? No. no. The, the sound is loud. You know, it's, 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 it's soothing. Um, but suddenly the propeller stopped turning um and it won't stop you can stop the video but um and i fell back into my seats uh and and i i remember you know looking out the other small little window uh and counting you know up to 13 and at at 13 i remember that propeller stopped turning as well uh and and i fell back into my seat and i realized suddenly uh, that the engines weren't working uh, and that we were going to um, crash. And I looked out the, the tiny little window, that's, you know, a cheek into the window, and all you could see was a, a, a sea of green, of, of triple canopy forests. Um, and I remember, you know, falling back into my seat and realizing uh, that death was not only certain, it was imminent. Um, and, and this is a photo you took on that flight. Yes. Flight, so this is the canopy of the, yes. of the jungle. Um, and, you know, uh, that you might not realize it, 
Um, but when, when you are facing death and death is imminent uh, and you have prescience of that, um, your brain takes over your body or your, your intelligence, your body's intelligence takes over from your brain. Uh, it stops your mind from its normal activity of being in a past or in a future. And it focuses you down to the only the present moment uh, so that you can focus on surviving some dangerous situation. Unfortunately, in this case, I found myself in a situation that you couldn't do anything about. Uh, not only could I not do it, but I couldn't even escape into a, you know, a projected uh, future that was somehow um, better. Uh, and at that moment, uh, when you have time to contemplate and there's nothing to do, what happens is your mind focuses on the things that matter most in your life, the meaning that you derive from life. Um, and what happened to me in this situation is my world focused down to a single point of light. And that light was my wife and my two children and how the knowledge was, I wasn't worried about my death. My d what happens is you focus on what your death means. And for me, my death meant when I hit the top of those trees that my family would be dying with me. Uh, and that, that knowledge instantaneously went to you know, every one of the, the 40 trillion cells that composed this consciousness and blossomed, but un tremendously unexpected. Instead of agony, I, I, I sensed that I, pure peace, a vibrant aliveness, okay, uh, uh, and an easiness that I had never experienced more. But even more profoundly than that, um, what happened was, you know, I could, I could literally sense um, the, the, the leaves on the trees below me, the animals that were in the forest, the seat back to my front, the three other passengers that were in the plane with me. I could even feel... All right, uh, the, the two pilots that were screaming crash landing. All right, um, you know, I, I realized that, you know, I'd, I'd felt this before um, in the past. You know, the times when sniper bullets missed me, uh, the times when motor rounds or rocket rounds just missed, or the times when suicide bombers or, or uh, IEDs on the side of the road, uh, uh, bombs on the side of the road, just missed, or the hundreds of patrols that I'd been on, I'd realized that in those moments, uh, I felt alive for the only time in my life. Um, but, you know, I allowed those moments of unexplained uh, contentment and satisfaction to leave me unex you know, unexamined and unexplained and therefore quickly forgotten. However, in that, in that tree, you know, I learned, all right, I learned that literally we are energy. You are, and you, and we are energy beings. We are literally connected to each other, all right, uh, and we are connected to every other living and non-living living thing in, in the world. And we, normally we go through life unable to feel that connectedness. Uh, and that's primarily because of how active our minds are throughout life. You may not realize it, all right, how active your mind is. But it's, it is in constantly, constantly thinking about the past, the future, and in the moment, if it is doing anything, it's, th it's judging the moment, either good or bad, all right? And unfortunately, it's often bad uh, judgment, all right? But in that plane, I, what, what happened to me, all right, was, you know, the intelligence that runs this body took over. And in the past, I realized that I had resisted life, all right? Somehow, for some reason, I unconsciously believed that, you know, I, I was going to make life my enemy. Um, and every punch I threw, somehow I believed unconsciously that it was going to change what had already happened. It was going to bring back the people that had died from my decisions or indecisions, all right? Um, but in fact, every punch that I threw at life, uh, that punch came back and hit me. All right, with greater intensity. And I learned that, you know, 
that all the suffering that I believed was coming from out there and into here was in fact coming from here onto uh, myself. But in that plane, my body intelligence took over and said, you know what, you know, we're going to try something different. Uh, instead of resisting life, all right, you know, we're going to surrender absolutely and unconditionally. Uh, and that's not surrender as in, you know, I'm gonna, you know yeah, that's, it's great. It's a good thing that we're, we're going to crash into trees. That's a surrender to not judge uh, internally what is happening. Uh, and when I chose unconsciously to surrender, I discovered all right, how, in fact, underneath the obscuration of your mind, we truly are not only um, connected, but that connectedness uh, feels um, amazing. All right? It's not a feeling that you derive from outside. It's a, it's a feeling that you are right now. Um, it's who you truly are. Um, yeah. But you didn't die. No. At the very last second, unbeknownst to us, the, the pilots had found a tiny little, uh, a tiny little road. Um, a road, and, not an airstrip. No, just a little okay. tiny road. Um, and at the last moment, I remember looking out the, the window and seeing the leaves go by and thinking that this was the end and then closing my eyes. Um, and instead, we smacked into a, a road and jumped over a, another truck, a vehicle on the road, slammed on our brakes, and the airplanes, you know, slammed forward. And, uh, and at that moment in life is the moment that, uh, you know, I, I have begun a journey of backing through a side door into consciousness, a, a journey that I'm still on today and I, that I'll always will be on because it's a, the destination is not forgetting, all right? Uh, the destination is not forgetting who we truly are. Now, you say, you know, What's the big deal about this, this separation and how when we feel separated, all right, when we feel like we're an isolated individual, what, what that impact is on our life? And it's truly unfathomable, unfathomable and unspeakable. So let's, let's I want to hear some, fi- I want some final words uh, of you, from you. So um, so I... This is a sociology class on race and ethnic relations, and I'm always trying to find ways to build bridges and build borders. And when I look at this meme that came into my inbox or came maybe on my Facebook page or something that was probably made by the Russians, you know, a couple of years ago. And, you know, and I think about this quote by the chief of staff of the, the NSC. Um, and I don't want to be political, but the, you know this is this is just perfect because a lot of Americans, a lot of people think this about Muslims. And um, so you're a guy who, hang on, I, I I wrote this down because I wanted to make sure that I get all the pieces. Um, you went the furthest, you went as far into enemy territory as a as a person could go, as any American could go. Um, you the stakes were the highest for you and others around you, the danger is most real in your interaction with people in the, in the Muslim world or just in another culture, but in this particular case. You're there 24-7. It's unfamiliar territory. If there's anybody that should walk away with ideas, at least like this or at least fear or at least having negative things to say, it would be you. But you walk away. You came away with this ideology of connection, that we're all connected. And you don't hate, and you don't fear. And how did you get, how? Can you, I, what I want you to do is, so here's, this is my message all semester to this class mm-hmm. and to these students. But this is me. I, I'm a knucklehead sociologist. You're a person who has every reason to not be connected. So I want you to stand right here in the center of the room. <laughs> And I want you to tell this class what it is that you have seen that would lead you to say, I'm not taking that path, that we're connected. Well, it's, it's, it's not that I look at that and say, that's, I'm not going to take that path. I mean, when I, when I went to Iraq, it was, I, I joined Special Forces when literally uh, September of 2001. Uh, that month is when I went and 
began my very first assignment. And I went to Iraq, um, not hating, but greatly disliking uh, Muslims. And by um, the way, we have four minutes. Okay. Yep. And, and you know, I, I came back, but let's, let's go back to, I, I think, the message that, you know, I, I, if anything, I'd like, you know, when, when you feel, all right, not only feel separated, when you feel disconnected uh, from every other thing, all right, to maintain that illusion of separation, um, uh, you need not only others, you need people to be more than other. And what is greater than more other than an enemy? Okay, you need enemies in life to maintain that illusion of separation. Um, and you know wh why is separation so ho horrible? All right, I mean literally, uh, you conceptually you can draw a circle around your legs. All right, and a lot and those who are inside of that circle, all right, you give the full measure of your empathy and compassion to. You can step into their lives. All right, and you can reproduce what you believe they are thinking and feeling in yourself. And not only that, you are able to have a deep inner need to respond to alleviate that suffering. All right. However, all right, if you're outside of that conceptual circle, all right, unfortunately, your empathy and compassion can be lessened, just like a dimmer switch. All right, it can be lessened, but not only lessened, uh, applied with bias. Okay. Uh, and if you went back 5,600 years, you could literally hop, skip, and jump across uh, you know, the human uh, misery and atrocity all the way to the present day where we are living in a time where you can see the effects of the subconscious belief in separation when entire nations, our entire nation, is led by an island of one. Okay? Not only that, you can see the exact paradox and simultaneous opposite of that, when the entire human species is incapable of embracing the planet with empathy and compassion. So, you know, if, if there's anything I want to convey, it's to know, all right, what Buddhists have always known and what physicists now literally confirm, all right, no one can exist in isolation. It's not possible, all right? And if you feel separated, if you don't know you're connected, all right, it's an illusion. In, right? in, you are energy beings. Including with people on the other side of the world. Yes. Hey, thanks, man. Hey, just so you know, uh, Bill is around tomorrow. If anyone would like to sit down with him and have a chat, uh, just come down to the front and we'll set up a time. All right?